My name is Ben. I'm a uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist and uh, also co-founder and uh, executive director of Breaking Convention. So thank you for all coming to our party. Um, are you having a fun time? You having a good time? Yeah. yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So um, uh, apologies if any of you might have seen me talk about this before. I've been doing the same talk for 15 years and I'm going to carry on for another 15 years until the message is out there. So um, the talk is about my work as a child psychiatrist and how my work as a child psychiatrist and understanding of developmental psychopathology has brought me to the door of MDMA. Um, anybody who wishes to know about the human condition and the human personality and interaction and intimacy and dynamics and why we do the things we do, sit down on the floor with a child for years, play with them. This is where we learn about humans. Um, and interaction with children and interaction with parents is the basis, the basic fundamental understanding of human psychology comes from that. So I'm going to talk about this developmental trajectory in child abuse and trauma. And I'm going to talk about why we need MDMA and why I'm calling MDMA an antibiotic for psychiatry. So I'm going to talk about some of the lack of efficacy in current pharmacology and psychiatry. And then a little bit about our studies and also a little bit just about this psychedelic renaissance and what's happening in the world. So, have a look at that. Now, what is that a picture of? Is that a scared and frightened, bruised, humiliated 11-year-old girl? No. That is a piece of scum. Worthless, useless, public enemy number one, that is. She is. Stay away from her. She's sitting outside the tube station. She's 40 now. She's HIV positive. She's got one leg because she's been injecting heroin. She's addicted to heroin. She's addicted to alcohol. Don't give her a quid when she asks. She'll only spend it on booze. It's her fault. She did this to herself. She could stop if she wanted to. It's a lifestyle choice. Now, that's horrible, isn't it? But that's what we do. That's what society does. We turn off our empathy switch. We forget the developmental pathway. We forget how people become people with adult mental disorders and addictions. And we turn off our empathy and lose our compassion and lose our understanding. And that's deeply prof and profoundly unethical and immoral. But we need to tackle this because we need to understand the developmental roots of... of how trauma becomes mental disorder and addiction. So my own pathway has mimicked that of my patients. I, um, working in an inpatient adolescent unit for um, eight years as a consultant, working with child abuse and maltreatment, and then into teenagers with complex PTSD and adults with substance misuse. So I have five different jobs at the moment, which is really busy um, and breaking convention. But I work partly with adults with addictions, partly with children in a secure unit, um, and I do this research with MDMA. And so although it sounds like a weird career or job plan, it all makes sense to me, because it all adds up to this developmental pathway um, that has brought me to the door of MDMA. So we know about child abuse. Children are small, little things that require love, care, play, and attention. And we have the big, the big forms of child abuse that hit the social services radar, sexual abuse, physical abuse. But you mustn't take your eye off the ball with neglect and emotional abuse. I've worked with lots and lots of patients who are very damaged and we've assumed there must be some hideous physical or sexual abuse in their earlier childhood and we've looked into it with social services and it's not there. Don't underestimate the psychological damage of you're useless, you're worthless. We didn't really want you. I like your brother, but I don't like you. Um, Dad, look at this picture, shut up. That kind of emotional drip, drip, drip abuse of it destroys the self-esteem and it has profound effects later in life. Um, and child psychiatrists bang on endlessly about attachment, but quite rightly so. Now, we mustn't be fatalistic about the impact of attachment because then that suggests, well, if, we, if you screwed up your first three years, then sorry, mate, you're screwed. It's not that bad, or we'd all be out of a job as psychiatrists. Um, there are, there's plenty you can do to help people, but it's certainly true 
that damage to the early years has profound effects later on. A bit like a tree growing, you know, if you've got a little tiny sapling and you snap off one of the branches, when it grows into a big tree, it's always going to be distorted. Once you've got a great big tree with loads of branches and leaves, you can take bits off the edges and it's fine. So the stuff that happens early in life has a very profound impact on subsequent de development. But it's not just those forms of child abuse that are damaging. It's also psych uh, psychosocial things like this. So poor housing, poor education, social exclusion, unemployment, racism. When you work as a psychiatrist, the vast majority of your patients are coming from these situations. Now, of course, mental illness attacks the whole broad spectrum of all social economic classes and statuses and money. But on the whole, the majority of psychiatric patients are on the bottom rung of the ladder socially as well as emotionally and psychologically. So the, this is the cohort of people we work with. We work with the unemployed, the unemployable, the uneducated. That's mostly the case in severe chronic mental disorder, for obvious reasons. So what does this do to, um, well, the slides are a bit weird, aren't they? But they're a bit cut off, don't worry. What does this do to the developing brain? Well, um, it has physical changes. If you're exposed to a trauma and stressful environment as a small child, your brain develops to adapt to try and cope with that. So as a brief physiology lesson, two parts of the brain. The bit in red is the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is a very ancient part of the mammalian brain. Lots of mammals have it. It's the fight or flight response. It's the part that lights up in response to fear. Someone walks into the room with a knife now, your amygdala goes, danger, danger, get out, fear, fight or flight. Um, it's a very old part of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, the green bit, is much more sophisticated. Only humans or probably some of the other primates or dolphins or some of the higher mammals have a prefrontal cortex, but none of the animals have a prefrontal cortex like the humans. It's the, our human part, it's what makes us human. It's the part where we use rational logic, we can debate with ourselves, we can weigh things up, we can plan. So the guy comes in with a knife, the amygdala says, get out. The prefrontal cortex says, oh no, do you know what? He looks okay. Anyway, he's got a chef's hat on, so he's probably the chef. So it's where we, we're, so we're in a conflict between these two areas. Now, if you grow up in an environment where every time your caregiver comes into the room, you don't know if you're going to get a kiss and a cuddle and they're going to sit on the floor and do a jigsaw with you, or are they going to kick you or punch you or burn you with a cigarette, or are they going to rape you? And when you have that lack of consistency about caregiving, you become a feral survivor to survive in that environment. You have to have an exaggerated amygdala response. Having, you need to be scared of your environment. You need to keep checking behind every doorway. Because if you don't, you can die. So this amygdala response is a natural adaption to that environment. And also, there's not much good in having a prefrontal response. Not much good in having a part of the brain that allows you to see good in things and talk yourself through. There is no good in things. People who see good in things get hurt more. So the prefrontal response also doesn't develop properly. So you get these physical changes to the brain. And PTSD and PTSD on another line. Um, I didn't have time to change the, the formatting on these. We've seen in scanners with patients with PTSD, with an fMRI scanner, that so they have exactly this. They have an exaggerated fear response that's demonstrated by uh, excessive activity there. And they have a shrunken prefrontal response. They're not so good at seeing the good in things. Now, PTSD is an extremely troublesome and difficult disorder. 15, 20 years ago in psychiatry, PTSD was the term we used for a severe catastrophic life event in which you thought you were going to die. Car crash, fire, uh, serious single assault, combat assault, um, in which you were certain you were going to die, and it was catastrophic. Um, we've broadened that diagnosis now, and we, talk, and we now call that sort of PTSD, we call it simple PTSD, and we talk about this other phenomenon, complex PTSD, in which the individual traumatic events don't need to be catastrophic and life-threatening, but they could just be repeated, extremely terrifying experiences, like child abuse. So the end phenotype is the same, and the disorder is characterized by re-experiencing phenomena, right? Flashbacks during the day, triggered by cues that remind you of the trauma, and nightmares at night. Um, and when a person has a flashback, they 
have what we call a dissociative episode. They kind of literally relive the experience in all the sensory modalities. They, you can be, I, I've, I've been working with teenagers and I'll be talking with them and then they'll just stop and they'll freeze and they'll start mumbling and they'll start scratching themselves. And they're seeing the abuser come towards them and they can hear it and they can smell it and they can smell the whiskey on his breath. They go back to this experience and it's extremely disabling. So we have flashbacks and nightmares, we have high levels of anxiety, high levels of what's called hypervigilance, and that's this edginess, you're always on edge, you're always looking for the next attack. Um, and high levels of substance misuse and addiction, because what people want to do is just blunt the edges. They cannot be there with their trauma, they cannot talk about it, they cannot think about it, they will do anything to do, not think about that night when they were six years old. So they will drink and they will use opiates and they will blank themselves and they will avoid going to the trauma. They have to because they would be so overwhelmed if they did. Very hard, it's very hard to treat and we have a 50% treatment resistance. That means that 50% of sufferers with PTSD do not get cured by the treatments that we have. So we have maintenance therapies. So you treat the symptoms, you treat it symptomatically. If they're depressed, give them an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic drug. If the hypervigilance gets so high that they start becoming paranoid, give them an antipsychotic. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabiliser. So by the time I see them in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they rattle them on so many tablets. And none of these tablets are curing them. They're just papering over the cracks, treating the symptoms as they arise. They're not getting to the heart of the cause. Similarly, the psychotherapies. We've got loads of psychotherapies. DBT, EMDR, trauma focus, CBT. IPT, CAT. Now, the psychologists in the audience may argue with me about how these psychological models are all very different and specific and focused, and indeed they are. 20 years in psychiatry for me, psychotherapy is we need to talk about your pain. That's kind of what it boils down to. And that's great, and that's fine for 50% of people. And they do, and you go to a psychotherapy session and you cry, and it's distressing, and it's difficult, and you build up your relationship with your therapist, and you slowly talk about your pain, and you can overcome that. And that's great for 50%, but for a significant half, they just cannot do that. They will, they will flee, they drop out of therapy, they um, use drugs and alcohol, because they don't want to talk about it, and they can't talk about it. This is not good enough after 100 years of modern psychiatry. We need to do better than that. Yeah, yeah. We need to do better than that. We have not had any new pharmacology in psychiatry for 50 years. We are on old drugs. And the reason being is we are not attacking the cause. We are not attacking trauma. So a little analogy for you, which is where the antibiotic comes in. And in the end of the 19th century, in general medicine, we were really good at treating um, symptoms of infections. People were dying of infections. We were losing the battle to the infectious diseases. We knew people died post-operatively. We knew they died if they got infections and in the lungs, TB. We knew that people had smallpox. And we were losing the battle because we didn't have the antibiotics. And then in the early 20th century, we started to understand about the microbes and we developed antibiotics and we killed the bugs. Now, we are in a similar position in psychiatry today. We are excellent at epidemiology, just like we were back then in the 19th century around infections. There are massive volumes of 19th century literature about smallpox. Who gets it, how many people die of it, what we call it, how we classify it, but they couldn't treat it. Now we're in that position in psychiatry today. We write these diagnostic manuals, we have all our labels and our diagnoses and we have wonderful psychiatric epidemiology departments. We know who gets depression, who gets anxiety, how many people get addictions, but we don't treat them. We treat them symptomatically with these maintenance drugs. So we need an antibiotic. Another way of looking at it as an analogy, if you've got a, if you've got a fever, if you've got a, an infection because of a bug, you can take a drug like paracetamol or ibuprofen, great, brings down the fever, treats the symptom, makes you feel a bit better. And sure, why not? But it's not an antibiotic, paracetamol or ibuprofen. It, it doesn't actually kill the bug. And when we give these patients SSRIs, hypnotics, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, they are not antibiotics. They're not hitting the bug. They're just hitting the outside symptoms. And they have a place, yeah? I mean, I would be a hypocrite if I, if I said I didn't prescribe them. I do, it's all we've had. 
It's all we have in psychiatry. So we do use these medicines, but they're not good enough. So here is the antibiotic. 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. It is the perfect tool for trauma psychotherapy. It ticks all the right boxes. It's a psychedelic in the broader sense. It's not a classical psychedelic. It's an intactogen. But it, it's a psychedelic in the broadest sense of being a mind-manifesting drug that you can use, the mental use that mental space to explore personal, meaningful memories. It's short-acting. It's almost always pleasurable or tolerated, which is very important clinically. Psychedelic, you know, classical psychedelics are very useful tools clinically, but a lot of people can't tolerate them and also can't even tolerate the idea of them. So in terms of accessibility, MDMA is, is, is more likely to be more access, accessible to the general public in treatment. It's all, and this, the fact that it is tolerable, you know, there are a few drugs in pharmacology that are invariably pleasurable, the opiates being one. Um, I challenge any of you to take heroin and not have a pleasant experience. If you don't like heroin, you don't have a brain. <laughs> Sounds like a contentious thing to say, and I say that purely in terms of its pharmacology. Similarly, cocaine. You, everybody likes cocaine. You can't really not like it because these things tap into fundamental parts of our brain physiology. Now, by saying that, I'm not condoning the use of these drugs. I'm using this to illustrate a point about pharmacology. And MDMA, similarly, is almost always pleasurably tolerated. But it's the access to empathy that makes it so important. It's the ability to be with your painful memories and not be overwhelmed by the negative affect that normally accompanies recall of those memories. And when people take MDMA clinically, they say, oh my God, I can talk about this. I spent 40 years doing anything but even think about the word rape. And now I'm sitting here for eight hours talking about the experience in detail. This is amazing. How do I do this? And it's because MDMA is like this life jacket you wear, this bulletproof vest that protects you, and gives you the energy and power to be with your pain and not be overwhelmed by it. So it's this unique receptor profile that makes it so interesting. Now, it hits all these. It's, if you were going to design a drug just out of the blue, in order, if you had a chemist and a PTSD therapist, and they sat down together, and the PTSD therapist said to the chemist, I want you to design a drug with the following fa factors in it. They would just, they'd come up with this. So, let's make it work at the 5-HT1A and 1B receptors. That's great. Positive mood, sense of euphoria, reduced depression, increased, uh, reduced anxiety. That's a great thing. Good thing to have a positive mood. These are people who've never felt positive mood. They've never felt love. And yeah, it's drug-induced, transient experience. It's an intoxication, it's not real love. But if you've never had that feeling ever, what people say is, my God, I had no idea I was capable of this experience. I've never felt this. People have talked about love. They've said, oh, I love you. And I kind of say, yes, I love you. But I didn't mean it because I didn't really know what it felt like. And now I realize it, it's a drug effect. It's not real. But now I can take this back into my world with something to go on as to what love feels like. So the positive mood at 5-HT1A and 1B. Works also at the 2A receptors, which is where the classical psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and mescaline work. Not as intensely, we're not talking dripping walls, but the capacity to think outside the box and see new meanings in things. There's that wonderful connectivity of networking that you get with the 5-HT2A um, partial agonists. At the dopamine, receptors, the amphetamine part of the drug, speeds you up, motivates you to engage in therapy. But paradoxically, at the same time, at the alpha-2 receptors, it drops you down and it slows you down. Now, that's weird. And if any of you have ever taken MDMA, you would understand that feeling of being speeded up and chilled out at the same time. And what this does is it drops you into the ideal zone, the optimal arousal zone for psychotherapy. You don't want too much speeded up because you've, they've got hypervigilance. So the alpha-2 receptors brings that down. But it's here at the hypothalamus with the release of oxytocin where we get this empathy effect. Oxytocin is a hormone secreted from the, breasts, not, uh, from the brains of breastfeeding mothers. That'd be weird. <laughs> Actually, I bet there is oxytocin in breast milk that is transferred to the baby that way. But um, it, it engenders a sense of protection and enmeshment and engagement and bonding really, really vital part of it. And there's our PTSD again. What else does MDMA do? It appears to do the exact opposite to the amygdala 
and the prefrontal cortex that PTSD does. It boosts the prefrontal response. It allows you to see things positively and it reduces the amygdala response. Things that you normally find frightening are not frightening. This is a very important tool. Now, <clears throat> we're doing, we've done studies with um, people with PTSD going into fMRI scanners. We've done studies with people, um, I, when I say we, I mean the community, I don't mean me. We've done studies with healthy people taking MDMA into fMRI scanners, demonstrating this. What's never been done is taking people with PTSD, putting them into an fMRI scanner, and then giving them MDMA. And that's the study we're doing in Cardiff. And it's a double-blind placebo-controlled study, crossover study design. Um, they go into the scanner. They've all got treatment-resistant PTSD. They take either MDMA or placebo, um, and we traumatize them slightly. We play them narratives, um, narrative scripts of their traumatic experience. And we kind of induce a mild sense of trauma. Um, you might think, oh, that sounds a bit unethical, but you know, these people are having this every day of their life. You know, they, they live with this. So, um, and we're going to look at the prefrontal cortex amygdala response, expecting to see that um, reduction under MDMA. And this is a really useful study because it gives a kind of mechanistic validation of psychotherapy. Because the, the psychotherapy studies of PTSD are all ongoing, but this is a kind of physical mechanistic validation of how the psychotherapy works. But I'm going to move off from that onto this dangerous legal high. We in this country have the most extraordinary relationship with alcohol. It's really damaging. I don't know why it's so bad in this country, it's just bad. And those of you who aren't from this country probably notice that. You know, you walk down the high street on a Saturday night, they're selling quadruples for a pound. Everyone's talking about it. It's breakfast TV. Oh, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to get bladdered. You know, it's in our national culture to be drunk, 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 drunk. And it's really bad for us. About 20 years ago, we had a, this thing called Health of the Nation targets. They had seven different targets that they wanted to meet within 20 years, reducing um, diabetes and high blood pressure and cancer and these things. And one of them was liver disease. We've hit the targets in all six of them except liver disease. It's on the rise, and especially in young ladies. It's a real problem. It's a time bomb we're sitting on here. <clears throat> and it's a very difficult industry to work against. They are so rich and powerful politically and financially. So the entire annual NHS budget for alcohol rehab is exactly the same money as the first six seconds of the new Smirnoff advert. That's the money that we're up against. <laughs> entire NHS budget for inpatient rehab, they, Smirnoff spent the same amount <coughs> on, on uh, their advert. So it's a huge challenge and that's why we chose alcohol because the relapse rates at, nine, uh, at three years post detox with current treatments are 90 percent this is not good enough after 100 years of psychiatry will mdma work to treat alcohol well <clears throat> classical psychedelics have a very rich history in addictions in fact pretty much most most of the early work was was addictions the work from osman's work in in canada in the 50s with lsd and we've had loads of other stuff over the years since then and the revisiting of studies like the ketamine studies in uh, russia and the psilocybin studies and the way these classical psychedelics work to treat addictions is they blow your mind with this mystical spiritual peak experience and from there there's a kind of natural tendency to go on to sobriety. And all of those addiction studies, the stronger the spiritual mystical experience, the greater the rates of abstinence. So that seems to be the tool. Now, we don't get that with MDMA. Not much. About 10 to 15% of first-time threshold MDMA users will describe a spiritual or mystical experience. But only 10 to 15% compared to the 80 to 90% who will describe that with a classical. So... That's not really a big part of it. A little bit of it, but it's not a big part of it. So maybe for that reason, my study won't work. But we think it will work, because where MDMA does work really well is the trauma aspect. And 98% of my patients with addictions have awful traumatic histories. So if it's not going to work at the psychospiritual level, it's going to hopefully work at the trauma level. And the study we have is in Bristol, so they, they have a detox. Now, an alcohol detox um, 
involves taking high dose benzodiazepines for about seven to 10 days to get you off the physical effects of the alcohol. And then you go into a psychotherapy scheme or whatever. So they come in after their detox. Then we have an eight, eight week course of MDMA therapy in which they take MDMA twice, uh, day long sessions, uh, 125 milligrams. And then two hours later, half that dose, 62.5 milligrams. Um, we see them before and after for integration sessions. And then we follow them up at three, six and nine months. Now, this is an open label study, okay? There's no control group. Um, that's fine. It's never been done before. It's completely innovative. So to do an open label study in the first instance is fine. It's essentially a safety and tolerability study. If nobody dies, we've done okay. If a few of them don't drink as much, that's a bonus. But the main thing is it's a demonstration of the safety and tolerability of this, of this proposed treatment. Um, it's done in Bristol. Bristol's a fab place, San Francisco of the UK. You really want to go there. London sucks. Um, <laughs> we've run into a bit of trouble having, getting our MDMA made. Um, and that was me. That was me up at Chasen Pharmaceuticals over 18 months ago, and it's still not ready. And the, scar the price has rocketed, and we're really struggling getting the medicine. Everything else is in place. All the um, approvals are in place, the pharmacy, the team, the, um, everything's there except the actual MDMA, and we're very close. We had an email yesterday that we're very close. Um, I want to just finish by just saying a little bit about the psychedelic renaissance and for young people in the audience who are interested in this field. Now, when I approached my tutors as a psychiatric trainee 15 years ago, talked about this, they said, you're crazy, you're mad, this is career suicide. Why do you want to align yourself with these crazy hippies? Why don't you study something nice like antidepressants? <laughs> and I persevered and I stuck to it. And it is not career suicide at all. And if as young people, and a lot of people approach me throughout the conference and say, I don't know how to broach this with my tutor, because you know, what, what are they going to say? Well, I, what I say is tell your tutor to open their bloody journals. Because this is not hippie stuff. This is not some fringe thing. This is mainstream medicine. This is cutting edge neuroscience. Every major teaching institution, neuroacademic institution around the world are looking at psychedelic programs nowadays. Yale, Harvard, Bristol, Cardiff, NYU. UCL, UCLA, and we're getting monthly papers in mainstream journals, Lancet, BMJ, British Journal of Psychiatry, BAP. It, this is hugely represented and it's coming into mainstream medicine. So when you meet those erroneous views that tell you this is some weird fringe thing, they just don't understand their own subject and go, go and talk to someone who does because they need to get on board and so do you. You need to get on board. We have eclipsed the 60s, yeah? People talk about the psychedelic 60s. This is way more psychedelic now than we were back then, both culturally and scientifically. We've got so much work going on. This is the psychedelic era. The last one was just the first bite of the cherry. You guys are here in the pioneering position to take this forward. And it touches all aspects of, the, of society and academic work. So um, in the last 10 years, I've been injected with LSD, psilocybin, ketamine, DMT, and I've taken MDMA. And I can say that openly, because that's all legal. I've done all of those legal studies, and I've also administered those drugs to people in these studies. And I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, there's lots of stuff going on. Find out what's going on in your local academic department. Get involved. Write papers. So many people I need to thank for my journey. Um, everything at MAPS and at Hefter and the people at Imperial um, and at Beckley. And um, I'm so grateful to all of you for your support at Breaking Convention. As if you've read the introduction I put in the white book, because I edited the white book, rebranding psychedelics one haircut at a time. I get into fights with hippies. I want to increase accessibility of this, yeah? I don't want this to stay some small little cliquey thing that you have to go to Peru or a TP in Glastonbury to do. I want this in NHS clinics. I want doctors to be able to give this to my patients. My patients are not hippies. My patients are tracksuit wearing, shaven headed, tattooed, hard blokes from Western Supermare who smoke cigarettes and drink lager. And my God, they need MDMA more than anyone. They really do. Because this is not a public enemy. It's just a little girl. Thank you.